himself before we read the verses. Namrita. I told Brother Namrita, I'm going to ask him some questions. <laughs> so, what does anybody remember last week's message? Five great people. Five great people. Did you say that? Joe, brother, you said something. Five great people. Five great people. Okay. What, uh, what was the serious title that brother mentioned? Brother, did you mention series? <laughs> okay. Joy of the The joy of a believer. Right? This uh, evening, I'd, I'd like to continue on the same thoughts. Uh, I want to read verses 1 through 9, but I want to spend most of the time today in verse 9. Before we read the verses, I want to do, ask you to do something today. Brother Prasad, thank you so much for helping me this morning. I heard an illustration from a brother when he was talking about Philippians 3. And it stuck with me for a while. I think it stuck with me forever, I guess. I think it would be beneficial to share that illustration before I talk uh, on this topic. Before I even can uh, tell you the illustration, I want some help. And Prasad, but Prasad helped me with that this morning. How many of you know what pole wall is? Okay. I need help to explain. <laughs> Brother Joel, you want to try? <laughs> okay. So pole war uh, is a game or is a sport. Typically, uh, it is conducted during the Olympics. Right? So you have a big pole. Most of you know this. You have a big pole. You would run a certain distance. If you want to call it, you can call it an accelerating zone. Use the pole's momentum and the pole's tension that would create a lift of your body so you could overcome a physical barrier and get out to that uh, destination where And whoever does that most efficiently would be the winner. Okay? Does everybody get what the game is? What the sport is? Yes, sir. Yes. yes. Because it'd be based for it. I would explain it again if you're not here. So that's the essence of the game. Right? Now I want you to stretch your imaginations. Just imagine all of us here are qualified for the Olympics. And you are one of those participants in the pole wall event. Now remember you're Olympians, right? You're participating. In the Olympics, so you're really, really good at this sport. Right? Now you come to my house, I'll take you to Hayward. I'll take you to a, just before we hit uh, the St. Matthew Bridge. How many of you know the St. Matthew Bridge? All of us know. Right? So I'm going to take you to this side of the bay, which is Hayward, <laughs> my hometown. I'm going to give you that whole walk. Remember, you're all very good at this sport. I'm going to give you this pole wall. I'm going to ask you to what? Cross, Tell me. Cross the bay. <laughs> cross the bridge? I'm waiting for you to be. <laughs> I want you to be in the airport. Right? To do a whole wall flight. <laughs> you should be in the San Francisco airport. <coughs> With the luggage? <laughs> yeah, you, you create the width so you get to a certain height and you can get to the other side. <laughs> you have to get to that vertical height so you can go to the other side. Okay? How many of you can do it? Okay, let's read the verses. I want you to, I'm halfway through the message, I'm going to ask you the question again. I'm going to ask you the question twice. I want you to be in that 
framework of that athlete who is going to venture to use the pole wall to get from this side of the bay, that is Hayward, to San Francisco Airport. Okay? Let's read uh, Philippians 3, 1, 9. 1 to 9. Let's read these verses as possible. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law of the Pharisee. Whatever was to my prophet, I was the loss of the but whatever things were gained to me, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. <laughs> and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come to your feet this afternoon, Lord. Lord, we come to you as needy people. Lord, we ask of you that you will speak to our hearts this afternoon, Lord. <coughs> Lord, unless you speak, there is no life for you. We need your word of life. We ask of you that you will visit us this afternoon. Speak to us through your word of God. Help us, Lord, to see the Lord Jesus Christ lift up. Help us to see his glory. Lord, unworthy I am, O oh Lord. Unworthy. Please, Lord, speak to your people. Cause your people to grow. Cause your people to be recited. I ask for your blessing upon this time. I ask these things in the precious name of my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I, uh, I, I try to read a lot before I speak on a topic, and uh, I, I have a reference for Philippians. Uh, the name of the author is Dr. I think it is Mortier, M-O-T-Y-E-R. And he uh, summarizes Philippians uh, in one sentence, which fits very rightly with what uh, Brother Navin shared. He says, Jesus is our joy. Jesus is our joy. Another Navin said, the joy of a believer. The joy of a believer. It is true. Jesus is everything for us. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul is talking to mature believers. Who is the fifth witness that uh, Brother uh, Naveen pointed out of the fifth grade people? Brother <coughs> pointed out last week. The Church of Philippi, right? The five great people, he said. These were strong believers. These were strong believers. They supported Paul in his preliminary 
missionary works in the second missionary and thereafter journey. So these are strong believers. And Paul is writing to them again. My brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me. It is a safeguard for you. He's saying, rejoice in the Lord. I'll say the same thing. Why? Because it's a safeguard for you. He goes on to say, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. I want to title it possible. I don't know if the message would come out that way. But I want to title it this way, possible. Beware of the joy breakers. Beware of the joy breakers. I, I think icebreakers is a good word. I learned it from our brothers. Joy breaker. There are joy breakers too for a believer. And Paul is mentioning what these joy breakers are. He says, he uses very, very, very strong words. He says, he uses three words to characterize this particular philosophy or this particular thought. He says, beware of the, he calls them dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Later on, I will talk to you about uh, why Paul calls them evil workers, why Paul calls them dogs. But for now, I want to uh, stay with why Paul calls them beware of the all circumcision. Please turn with me to Acts chapter 15, verse 1. There are certain men which came down from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Uh, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, ye cannot be saved. That was the teaching this group of people brought into the Philippian, or actually they brought it to the Galatian church and they basically hindered the work that was going on in the churches of Galatia. They broke or they disturbed the churches in Galatia through this teaching. You shall be saved. How? Circumcision. By circumcision. By circumcision. Paul, as a father, would be careful about his children. He's, he's talking to his spiritual children, his mature children. And he's saying, beware of the false circumcision. Beware of their teaching. And he goes on to say, we he goes on to give the characteristics of a true believer. And he says, we are the true circumcision. We who worship in the spirit of God. We who glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Gives three characteristics of a true believer. A true believer worships in the spirit of God. He glories in the Lord Jesus Christ. He boasts all his sufficiency, all his contentment is the Lord Jesus Christ. For him, Jesus is everything. And last one, he says, the true mark of a believer is he does not put any confidence in the flesh. That's a, that's a trait of a true believer. No confidence in the flesh. No confidence in anything he has to offer to God. Paul's uh, telling the church, beware of false circumcision. Because this uh, teaching was spreading. This thought process was spreading. And he goes on to give his own example. According to the flesh, I'm far superior than this group of people who teach salvation is through circumcision. Salvation is Believe in Jesus Christ, 
plus be involved in the act of circumcision, and then you are saved. Paul's telling, I'm far, far superior to these people who teach this theology. He boasts, he doesn't boast, but he qualifies. He gives his own qualifications when compared to this group of people. If you look at verse uh, 5, he gives eight qualities about himself. The first one he says is, I am circumcised on the eighth day. Paul's parents might have been very, very devoted. They were a true Jewish family. They circumcised Paul at the age of eight. Probably they, they brought him up in the Jewish way very, very strictly. He belonged to the nation of Israel. He belonged to the Jewish nation. He, in men's sight, if at all there is a great nation, it has to be the Jewish nation. Because through them came the Savior of the world. Through them came divine revelation to mankind. Through them came the oracles of, of, of God to us. He belonged to this superior race or superior nation called the Jewish nation. He belonged to a tribe of Benjamin. Who is, which tribe did the first king of Israel belong to? Benjamin. Who is he? Saul. He is named after Saul himself. Right? He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews, like I said before. He was brought up in this strict Hebrew background. If at all there is an ethically qualified man, it has to be Paul, according to his race, according to his upbringing. He goes on to say, as to the law, a Pharisee, well educated man. Educated in what science? No, educated in the law of God, in the word of God. Next quality he says is, he persecuted the church. The last one he says is, as to righteousness that comes from the law, found blameless. He obeyed the law wholeheartedly. Man belonging to the most, if you want to call it from a human perspective, the best ethnic origin, the best education, a family. A man who is morally good, when you compare it to a man's standards, he is morally good. He, according to the law, he was found blameless, he says. This man, he says something interesting in the subsequent verses. He says, verse 7 and 8. All things, these, all these earthly qualifications being born in a Jewish family, having all the education, being morally upright according to the worldly standards, these are all nothing. These are base, these are worthless, these are dumb. Why? Because these cannot give man, me, Paul, a superior man, a right standing before God. Paul says, rather than having this earthly qualification, I would like to have one. I would like to know Christ, to gain Christ. That's what he says. In verse 9 he says, I'd like to be found in Christ. That's what he says. Why? Why does he want to do that? Verse 9. Not having, a derived, uh, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. All these qualities of his cannot make him right before God. They're worthless. But knowing Christ, gaining Christ, being found in Christ, these give him a righteousness from God. Give him a right standing before God. 
He says he'd rather have a righteousness that comes from God. This is consistent with his theology in Romans 3 and Galatians. He says there is a righteousness that comes from God. He says, by the law, no man can be justified before God. But God freely gives a righteousness that comes from God. God is the author of this righteousness. The Holy One, the Righteous One, the One who defines standards, the Divine, the Divine One, the Morally Perfect One. He gives righteousness. And I want to have this righteousness, the righteousness that comes from God. God is the source. God is the author of this righteousness. He goes on to say in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, 